I'd like to thank Ralph from the um, LGIDA. Is that right? Yes. Um, for having us along today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I run a little small consultancy family business out at Wheelers Hill. It's pretty much uh, three or four of us at any one time, but um, my son Michael and I are the technical um, side of the business. Um, I started my career in government service, so I used to assess stormwater management plans um, in my role through Melbourne Water. Um, so I, I've, I've been on both sides of the fence, I suppose, and I've always said that you can take the girl out of public service, but you can't take the public service out of the girl. And I live by that. I, I think that the first 12 years of my career in government service, it forms the type of consultant I am. Um, we do assess a lot of stormwater management plans and review a lot of stormwater management plans from other consultants, usually through um, a request from council um, or the EPA, um, uh, those sort of agencies. Um, so we do look at it from your point of view quite often. And um, I'm hoping to uh, show you what we look at to make sure that um, uh, you're relatively happy that the consultant is giving you a good stormwater management plan. That they've looked at everything. Um, this is my take on uh, the uh, uh, version 5.2 of the IDM, which came out in March. Um, uh, Ralph and I think the, co the committee or the updated it at that time based on some recommendations of myself and Michael, and also um, uh, updating it to be compliant with Australian Rainfall Runoff 2019. Um, but it's just our take on it. If you disagree, um, uh, maybe speak up. I will try and get this done in 45 minutes, but I can tend to go on a bit, so I might ask for questions to be at the end, um, so that I, so that we at least get the presentation done. Um, and then you can, if you've got a question, maybe write it down and, um, and let me know. I, we've got hard copies of the presentation. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, there's also extra copies at the back if you want to take some for people who haven't been able to make it today, but I'm sure with the videotape, um, you'll be able to see uh, or have people at work who aren't able to see today um, pick it up at a later date. Okay, what is a stormwater management plan? I'm pretty much going through the IDM definitions. Um, uh, stormwater, uh, clause 11 uh, talks about stormwater management strategies and two types of reports, a stormwater impact assessment report and a stormwater management assessment report. Um, and it says when they're normally required um, basically five dot points there required when a development includes the construction of one or more new retarding basins, water sensitive, uh, water sensitive urban design quality treatment facilities like wetlands or bioretention systems, uh, or, or new drainage outfalls. Um, if there's a, the potential for significant further development within the catchment, if the catchment involves multiple developers um, with a specific loca locality, if there's more than five lots involved, and large-scale industrial and commercial use will be involved. Now, I have seen this clause used by at least one council um, in the wrong way. They had a township zone um, of a satellite town from a, out from a big regional country town um, and five lots. It was uh, five lots that were being um, proposed to be developed by the uh, developer. And because of that, they used this as an out clause. However, in my opinion, they needed a retarding, no, actually they didn't, they did need a retarding basin, but they didn't get one in the end because, uh, or they're not gonna get one in the end because they didn't enact this clause. Um, but really there was potential for significant impact on the surrounding catchment. And council should have required a stormwater management plan in this case. So just be careful, just because it's five lots or less, doesn't mean you don't need a stormwater management plan. And I, I actually think you should be asking for them um, if in doubt. What's the diff difference between a stormwater impact assessment report and a stormwater management assessment report? I understand from Ralph that one refers to the internal catchment and one refers to the external catchment. Yes? Yeah. Which one is what, Ralph? Uh, look, I personally think we should do away with both of those terms and just have one. Yay. Good. And I think that's something that we yeah. should discuss. And then there's also table um, C5 in the IDM, which really starts to get things quite complicated. It talks about many different types of reports. A water quality impact report, which is the music 
um, modelling, uh, wa uh, the water quality design report, which is the uh, computations for the water, water sensitive urban design described in the drainage feasibility report. The drainage design report, um, again, <laughs> which seems to be repeating itself. The drainage feasibility report, so all those three lead into the drainage feasibility report. And also, if you've got an external catchment or flooding through your site, you need a flood impact report and a flood management design report. Um, the flood impact report is usually about big waterways that might be adjacent to or through your property. The flood management report is really required for all uh, stormwater management plans and shows the concept design of the mitigation techniques that you're acquiring for your development, retarding basins, uh, waterway corridors, overland flow paths, and so forth. Um, but usually, to do a development, we require um, water quality mitiga uh, mitigation or treatment, and we require flood mitigation. So usually require the purple reports, which feed into the, the drainage feasibility report, the water quality report, and the flood management report. That's my opinion, at the very least, for, for those small little developments out on the edge of town. So, what is a stormwater management plan? I, in my career, have only ever written up three reports like that when requested to by council because the IDM or their manual says you need three reports now. Usually, as a stormwater management plan, I write one report, and in that report, I include a set of drawings as well, but um, it basically encompasses all these items if, if required, and as a minimum, the water quality impact and the flood management impact and, and uh, mitigation. So we do it in one report. And I think almost every stormwater management plan we assess is pretty similar. They don't do it in these separate reports. So it seems a little bit um, complicated in the manual. So from now on, I'm gonna talk about it, doing it almost in one um, uh, report. Okay. Um, your, your job as an assessor is uh, to ensure all relevant issues have been addressed adequately. Okay, not that um, the consultant said they've addressed them, but they've addressed adequately. Um, check the C5 is really good in making sure that you do that as an assessor. But uh, checklists have their place. What really is required, and that what we look for when we review reports and um, uh, management, uh, stormwater management plans, is we like to see a story. Why are you doing the job? What are the issues? Ecological, heritage, rock, soil, power lines. What's the site like? What are the requirements? In other words, detailing a section by actually saying what they're trying to uh, achieve by um, uh, the uh, aspects of the stormwater management strategy, how the requirements are going to be met, and the calculations and modellings to show the requirements are met. And most importantly, and this is most importantly that you can do the calculations, but unless your wetland can actually fit onto your site, there's no point. Okay, so um, we find again and again and again that the music modelling says we're meeting best practice and they draw a lump, concept design stage, and if you really look at it, um, a wetland of that size can't actually fit into that site because of the site constraints. We're always designing to site. And even at concept design stage, which is a stormwater management strategy stage, we should be designing to site. And if you see blobs or, rec or worse, rectangles, throw it back at us, the consultant. It's not good enough. We need to be showing organic shapes which are designed to site. Okay. The second dot point there in red is something you guys really need to be looking at right up front in um, approving stormwater management pl plans. Who, the very first question, who's going to be maintaining this asset? In your case, if you're regional councils, you guys. Are we happy to maintain it? At this stage, you almost need a process in your system where the planners and the engineers talk to the maintenance guys. Melbourne Water do this. At planning stage, they talk to their, what they call their asset owners, um, which will be the guys that will be looking after it or the managers of the guys who will be looking after it, to see if um, they're happy with that type of asset. And the main asset I'm talking about is bioretention systems. I think music says bioretention systems are just so good for stormwater treatment, but I think uh, councils need to understand how high maintenance they are 
and that high maintenance is required continuously, many times a year, for the rest of that asset's life. Okay, so are you happy to do that, Council? If you are, go for it. If you're not, maybe ask them to look at something else and get a few more, like a wetland, and take a few more development lots away. Don't let snowball start. In other words, I think this is an air gap in the industry where the planners get the stormwater management plan, it looks fine, they give it a tick and the snowball starts. There's a bioretention system designed on a slope like this on a very clay catchment that has sediment coming all the, all, off it all the, all the way. As the snowball gets bigger and bigger, the ticks keep coming and you end up with an asset that often is unmaintainable and blocked in its, in its worst case. And um, because it's unmaintainable, you can't fix the problem. So that no matter what music says, you haven't achieved anything. So just really make sure that you address snowballs or potential snowballs very early and just stop, stop the developers pushing you too hard. Okay, so this is the typical type of uh, reporting that we do. Um, uh, so I've just pulled out um, the typical context of a stormwater management plan we would do, and I've sort of put ticks on usually required as a minimum in a stormwater management plan, which sort of goes back to those first few slides. Um, so really a project description, and then in the site description we want the internal catchments, outfall conditions, and site context as a minimum. And um, uh, yeah, site context um, really is talking about you know uh, what the developer wants, but also what's there already in terms of constraints. If 2.1 is very important too. If there's external catchments and creeks, even if they don't intersect or go through the site, if they're close or adjacent to the site, potentially a flood impact, uh, that needs to be addressed as well. But often for the small subdivisions on the edge of town, it's at least the 2.2 the, the, uh, to 2.4. Um, and then we look at the assumed um, requirements and constraints. So the consultant needs to list out for you what they're trying to address. Subdivisional proposals, because they've got a client, so they need to know what, you need to know what that is. Um, flood storage requirements, water sense of urban design requirements, asset ownership. At this stage, it asks the consultant to tell you who's going to be owning it, because at the very least in the reporting, it said, this is council's. Okay, so if you're signing off on it, you're saying, okay, it's ours. And uh, at least uh, flora and fauna, um, and probably heritage as well, uh, constraints at that stage as well geomorphology in specific areas, especially very sandy areas or very rocky areas. Um, again, um, then it goes into the stormwater management plan description and you want um, the retarding basin design. Um, I suppose for very small stuff, um, maybe on-site detention, but really in a rural situation we are probably talking retarding basin design for any significant five lotter or more. Uh, waterway management, so the waterway and flood level set and fill levels, of course, but only if there's an external catchment. Waterway, uh, stormwater treatment, the water sense of urban design strategy and proposals, the subdivisional drainage, just um, people like myself, which are drainage experts, often have to dovetail into the uh, civil designers to make sure that their pipe, pit and pipe design is consistent and dovetails into our major drainage system design in its basic form, that the outfall from the pipe goes into the top end of the wetland. You know? And also that it goes in at normal water level or just below. Michael and I have seen two, two in the last week where the functional design that we did in the stormwater management plan said bring that pipe in at or just below normal water level and they've brought the, the pipe in at the invert of the sediment pond, which means that pipe's going to be sediment, going to be full of sediment because um, they've missed out on that. So. Um, you know, internal pipe layout and the iteration between experts like ourselves and the detail designer is very important. But often in the small jobs, it's a detail designer doing it, both jobs as well. Um, and flood impact, overland flow paths, fill, and, fill plan and levels. So this is talking about um, five-year pipe in the, uh, well, five-year flow in the pipe and the hundred-year flow in the roads uh, to safe requirements. And the way in Victoria that we pretty much assess whether a design is safe is the Melbourne water um, flood hazard criteria uh, because the Melbourne water criteria relate to velocity and depth for design. You can also refer to the Australian rainfall and runoff uh, flood hazard criteria but that's really about assessment okay, rather than design 
Um, so uh, you can look at both, but really um, Michael and I are pretty much using the Melbourne Water um, floodway criteria. Okay, so at the very least then in the appendices, um, the stormwater management plan drawings are really, really important. And again, I'll talk about that more, but we need that to be not just a blob. It does need to be to a concept design standard, but even at that st stage, for those of you who have come to my course, where for a wetland, we're talking about contours above uh, a normal water level, a normal water level set, a top of extended detention level set, that you know what your invert you're aiming for, that you know the, the normal water level extent, the cut line extent, or the batters and buns that you might require. If there's a sediment pond, is there a sediment pond dewatering area? Where's the access track? All that needs to be talked about at concept design stage. If you leave it one more stage to functional, it'll be too tight. You won't leave enough space. Okay? And especially if you're doing big stormwater management plans like for PSP type work, that needs to be thought out really early. It sounds a lot, but that's what it needs to happen uh, quite early. Okay. The music modelling is usually an appendix, um, and it's usually just there to do the water sense of urban design sizing. Um, uh, we usually also do other hydraulic calculations, so there's sediment pond sizing, wetland pond velocity checks to make sure we're not re-entraining re uh, um, sediment, and then the checklists. We, in our stormwater management plan, if there's a checklist, <coughs> uh, most of, not, not the work we do is through Melbourne, or for Melbourne Water Drainage Schemes, so we use the Melbourne Water Wetland Design Manual checklist for deemed to apply criteria, and we put that in our reporting and give ourselves, ourselves a cross or a tick. Obviously, we try and do mostly ticks, but if there's a cross, we're, we're transparent about it. Why haven't we met that one criteria out of 76? So that we can go in and negotiate that to Council or, or Melbourne Water. And usually that's because we're designing to site and the site just can't do it. Okay? So, um, so uh, often we get that through. We do it by being transparent and also in providing the checklists, it's our job as a consultant to make it easy for you to sign, to sign the job off. Okay, to make your job easy. The, one of the horrible things I think that happens in our industry is consultants um, send work or, or, or plans, lots of stuff to the assessors and um, they're under pressure from their client or their bosses um, to get that job out by Friday, say. So they send it to you and then they've got an out. They can say to their client, it's with the authority. They're being slack again. It's going to be a couple of months. And they put it back on you. You look at it and you go, this isn't... this," And you know there's something wrong. It's just, just not a complete body of work. And so you might pull out two or three sort of things and send an email back. Um, and then the email tag starts. And nobody wins in that. But essentially, they're using you for quality control. And that's not good enough. If you insist that they put the checklists in, they have to do their own quality control. And that's really, really important. Um, yeah, so I think the checklists, if you've got a wetland um, and a sediment or, and or a sediment pond, the Melbourne Water Deemed to Comply checklist um, is a good way to start for wetlands. Um, the checklist C5 of the IDM is a, is a really good way to start, isn't it? You know, because that is sort of covering you guys as well. And if the planning permit is there, I think it's really useful as a consultant, to know that we've ticked the planning permit conditions. So that's a, that's a really nice thing to do as well. Okay, is development of stormwater management plan a linear process? And the answer is no. Um, this is Stormy Water Solutions wetland design procedure, but really it sort of ties into retarding basin design and also, because we often put our wetlands in retarding basins to achieve a dual benefit. Um, but really, what this is pointing out is it always, design in drainage always starts with the site. The site analysis is right up there as number one. We're out there on site looking at um, what the site can actually give us, where are the big trees, what needs to be protected, all that sort of stuff. Most important of all, what are we aiming for? How high is our invert level of the local creek or drain? That is a major constraint. Melbourne Water, I gather, at the moment have actually got an officer working on a number of schemes because uh, the schemes have been developed and there is no outfall, okay? So it's really, really, really important that that is clearly understood right up front. And then tying into that is the catchment analysis. So that's the modelling, usually um, a raw model 
um, or at the very least, if it's a small catchment, um, uh, usually something like a drains or a what is the other one? Get the civil civil cage. Civil cage. All those all those sort of things. You know, the pit and pipe type design. But the two merge in together, and then they sort of come out in wetland design. Um, we have a couple of things that we determine very early on. You can see we're already determining normal water level and top extended detention because we need to get that so we can know the water can actually flow downhill. And once we've set that, we know cut extents and that sort of stuff. So it's also tying into designing to site. As we get down, you know, we get into other bits of our, um, our wetland design and then we go to a working drawing. Again, designing to site. And then probably, you know, looking up at the site analysis as well. From the working drawing, we're getting into our retarding basin design, our pollutant modelling, our velocity checks. The little light blue lines there are every time we change something like maybe the pollutant, we might size the storage correctly, and we get onto pollutant modelling, we need to increase the wetland size. Once we've changed the site design, we have to loop back and do another loop. So it's not a linear process, we're continually looping, unless we get quite good at it. And, um, but I think even, even people like ourselves are continually looping. We do at least three or four, um, uh, just to optimise the design. Um, yeah, so it's, it really is not a linear process. And it's always going back to, does, do the proposals fit to the site? Can they actually fit in the site? And this is where it comes right back to the stormwater management plan because the stormwater management plan is really there to say we've got enough room to move if something changes during the design process. More is better. More space is better. Um, I'm going to do an example of an assessment of a stormwater management plan. Now, I found this a little bit hard to prepare for because what am I allowed to show you guys? You know, I assess a lot of stormwater management plans, but it's all sort of, you know, in confidence stuff. So I had to search a little bit to find something that I could show you. And luckily for me, a review I did back in 2011, um, and there is a, a link down here, um, which is actually my review report on the web. So I thought if my review report's on the web, I can show you this one. Okay, and it's actually Armstrong Creek um, Stormwater Management Strategy, um, which is an award winner actually out past Geelong. Um, for those of anyone from down that way. Nice. It's good, isn't it? It's come up <coughs> underground quite nicely, Armstrong Creek. Um, so we're, it's really starting the, the populations going through the roof down there, but the waterways and wetlands are sort of being constructed in stages and the ones that are constructed are looking really, really good, I think. Um, I think it was Water Technology and Neil Craigie. Um, and Neil is one of the best, essentially, and loves working in regional areas. Doesn't quite like working in Melbourne for that much, but anyway. Um, uh, so I've, I went through this one because I did review it, and so um, I'm showing you the process of a review. And essentially, uh, number one is, are the objectives clearly stated? These were the objectives copied straight from... Um, uh, Neil's report and the water technology report and um, basically everything's there that needs to be there and the main two things are um, the control of uh, uh, stormwater volume and runoff, um, in other words retarding basin type design and also um, best practice in regard to water quality, the 80-45-45 of TSS, T TP and TN. Um, and all the rest are really nice um, uh, aspects to it as well, which is what water sensitive urban design is, is about. We're designing spaces for people to breathe. We are designing places for people to breathe, especially when we're living on McMansions in tiny, tiny little lots. Um, and so space is important and retention and enhancement of waterways is really, really important for ecology. So all that urban design part of water sensitive urban design is really, really important in what we do. Um, so I gave that a tick. That's my tick down the bottom in the, in the thing. Um, the next step really is to take a step back and have a look at the gut feel of the infrastructure and the form. So this is the Armstrong Creek uh, development, sort of um, uh, south of the railway in uh, south of Geelong. And uh, basically, I was asking myself these type of questions. It did appear to be designed to fit into the existing contours. Um, uh, there was... An, uh, the assets were in the low points of the, of the contributing catchments. The, the assets are not lobs or rectangles. In other words, I'm, as a first glance, I'm looking at Neil's, all, the, all of these blue dog, blue um, shapes are offline wetlands, okay? 
Um, but basically, he hasn't drawn circles or squares. And that is a good sign. Right off, that's a really good sign. Um, generous waterway reserves, um, which is really, really, an, you know, gives you a sigh of relief every time you sort of see that. And uh, the ecological constraints were shown, mainly the trees out there as well. So this type of plan up front um, gives me a sense of that the consultant team is looking at this in the right way. In other words, drainage as an opportunity, not as I have to do it, which is the best type of job. So I was feeling good after this. Um, assessment of concept designs. Now, basically, um, for those of you who know Neil, he kind of does draw by hand. And, um, uh, but basically, again, this is one of the sites. He's shown me a normal water level. I don't think he's quite shown me an outfall point there. Oh, yes, he, he has, yes. He has shown me an outfall point, the 675, uh, which is the retarding basin part of things. So it looks like he's got a few retarding basins linked. Um, uh, and he's also shown me the normal water level extent and the cut line extent. In other words, he's drawn contours above, um, above the normal water level. And, and that means that the site is nicely um, defined. What he probably needs to do now is actually show me the site extent, but I think that's sort of implied by the road corridor there. Um, so again, if it's things like retarding basin and wetlands, um, Melbourne Water has a nice lot of checklists in, um, available under their sort of land development manual. Um, but really, we need to fit to site, even at concept design stage. No blobs, no rectangles, offset requirements to roads, bypass provisions, de definition of normal water levels, definitions of inlet and outlet levels, and cut line definitions. Some consultants may say this is too much at a concept design stage. It's not that much work. They're being lazy. Make them do it. <coughs> what Neil didn't, even though it kind of wasn't really shown so much on the drawing, um, he did very clearly show for all the assets listed out, you know, their properties, what they were achieving, what their hydraulic controls were, not just the size but the invert level, which is really important for a reviewer like myself. In other words, we can reproduce his results because he's given us enough information to reproduce them. Our pet hate is getting to having to review the type of report where it's kind of written with um, the attitude, we are the experts, trust us. Yeah? And in a way, the report doesn't give, you, doesn't give the reviewer enough information to review. It just says, we've done the job, trust us. No. A reviewer should be able to, if they had enough time, actually replicate the results. And this, you know, giving sizes, Inlet outlet controls means that you, we could actually do a rough model and, and um, uh, give it a tick um, uh, because he's given us enough information. Yeah, our rule of thumb is that the, the concept design proposal should be able to be verified by a qualified engineer without going back to the original consultant. And as soon as we feel we need to ring up the original consultant and say, what did you mean? Especially if we're asking that question more than six times, um, you know, you're really starting to feel that, you know, they're, they're not really telling you a story. Right back to that first slide, we're not telling us a story. We need the story. Um, if the assessor is finding they're getting more and more confused about how the systems fit or work, um, then you need to go back to the consultant. And I, I, I would urge you, to take the time, look at it properly, and not just go, not go back to them many times, but maybe do an internal workshop and go back with them with a full list, list of questions. And some of them might be minor questions and some of them might be major questions. And maybe even a meeting slash workshop with the consultant. Face to face is so much better than email tag. But essentially, to minimise email tag, don't just go back to them with two or three little things and then a few weeks later go back to them with another two or three little things, because then you guys are almost as much a part of the problem as the consultant getting you to do their QA. Go back to them with a full list and say, if you address, address these or work through these and negotiate through these with us, because it is a, sometimes a bit of a negotiation process, you know, we'll get closer to a solution. We all need to teach each other. We're all under stress, both in government service and in private practice. Let's look after each other and, you know, um, stop being a little bit, you know, them and us, I think, is probably my message. And don't accept the trust us, um, the complicated model can't be wrong argument. And we talk about this in our drainage course a lot. 
Just because a model is complicated does not mean it's right. And um, what it does mean is it's very hard to quiz, really hard to quiz. And often a more simpler model um, uh, that's easy to quiz is the better way to go. If you are feeling, and I, we have done reviews, uh, uh, one springs to Ryan for the city of Ballarat in particular about a flood mapping project where the, uh, the drainage engineer, I don't know if Ben's in today, um, but uh, he knew, he, he just had a gut feeling, this isn't right, that water doesn't go that way, you know. And he didn't, he knew what he was looking at, he knew he had a question, but he didn't have the technical ability to quiz it, so he got an expert like us to quiz it. It wasn't that expensive, you know, we, we're not talking 25,000 or anything like that, it's more on the lesser than, you know, between five and ten to do a pretty in-depth review of something like that. Um, but we confirmed his, 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 um, his gut instinct that no, just because the model said it's going to happen doesn't mean it will happen. Okay, the next thing in a stormwater management plan is to make sure the, um, all the external catchments are captured, and this is really important, especially in big regional strategies like this. Is it regional fraction impervious? Neil always does this, um, uh, gives a sub area a nice plan, oh, plans are just the best thing, um, and telling me what the fraction impervious was. I reviewed them against the manual at the time, and things have changed because fraction impervious has have gone up. Um, but I thought they were reasonable. I also, I don't check every area, but I probably check the total area to make sure it's captured everything. You know, that sort of thing. It's just that I'm not checking everything, I'm just making sure it looks reasonable. Um, I check whether the hydrological model he used is applicable for the application. And I refer you to the current chapter in ARNR 19, book 9, chapter 6. I'm looking at my son over there, um, which, which gives us some guide now on what is applicable hydrological models for certain types of applications. This is a fairly um, complex application because we've got a lot of retarding basins and waterways. So RORB is um, the model he used and it is applicable still under 19, uh, AR 19. And you can see all the ticks I've given. These are all the parameters in the RORB model. I've gone through them and I've given him a tick because they're the type of, um, in the old AR He's uh, met the requirement, and in fact, he's met the requirement for the new ANR too, in all these parameters as well. Um, the primary questions is the model valid for its application? I refer you to Book 9, Chapter 6, ANR. But really, for small subdivisions, pit and pipe design, um, programs like Civil CAD and drains and those sort of things, as long as they use the ANR uh, 2019 Bureau of Met intensities, they're valid. And for larger waterway things like this, um, RORB is a valid, um, or any sort of runoff routing model is a valid hydrological application. So they're all the models we've always used, so that's all good. Um, is the model actually representing what is proposed? That's a pet peeve of us. We find that in some consultancies, especially the bigger ones, maybe someone does the drawings and the design of that, and someone does the modelling, and they seem to not talk very well, and sometimes the models don't represent what the plans represent. So, just, you know, just a bit, bit of a look at whether <coughs> it's sort of making sense that way. And is it producing reasonable results? And there are rule of thumb checks. Um, for those of you who've gone to our course, I've sort of given you some rule of thumb checks for uh, flows and that sort of thing, which are useful. We're not looking for a right result. We're looking for a reasonable result in drainage, OK? Because we get the same job to all of us. We all get different results. Um, we look at the music model. We like to see the music model consistent with the raw model, or at least with, <coughs> say, the drains model. Um, in this case, it was. He's basically um, superimposed. So I could look at his raw model catchment plan in AutoCAD, or whatever, and see that the music model was completely consistent with that. It's always good to get the models, the hydrological model and the music model from the consultant, so that the reviewer can quiz it. And also, um, uh, you can use auditors, and the Melbourne Water Music Auditor, which is available online, is a good one for most of Victoria. Um, and if you're hooked into the Music Link through eWater, which I think the only council in Victoria is Warrnambool, um, you could use the Music Link Auditor as well. Anyone else hooked into eWater Music Link? No. And again, I've gone through all the usual input parameters, which you could look at as well and given him a tick. But a lot of these things are usually picked up in the audited programs, like the Melbourne Water Auditor. 
um, is the hy hydraulic model. So he's used HECRAS in this case. No, no, they used my plug because they got um, uh, water technology uh, involved to do the um, flood level modelling. So they used Neil's inflows um, and then used Mike Flood to uh, uh, do the uh, water level modelling. And basically, was it valid model? It's a two-dimensional model. It's valid. Um, was the Manning's end right? Yes. All these sort of parameters, were they good? Yes. You know, it's that sort of simple look at whether the hydrological model, again, looks reasonable. And then also with that, you're looking at have they actually set fill level requirements properly. You look at the plans, this, all this looks reasonable, you know, um, but what I really like is a plan like this, which gives the water levels. Plans like this just tell you it floods to certain depths. But I really like a plan that actually gives, you know, the lines there are the actual water level to AIHD, which means that if you're giving, putting a house just downstream of that road, you'd make it at 37.6, or that lot at 37.6. You know, it gives... Um, us something to work with without having to go back to the modeler. Whereas with that, you'd have to go back to the modeler and say, how high do we have to make that? Yeah, it's really, really important that you uh, get models that make sense to you or outputs plans that make sense to you. Okay. Um, I then thought to myself, you, that's a big job. That's like a PSP type job. More that the sort of stuff that comes over your desk is the little stuff. Um, the small development, you know, um, on the edge of town somewhere. What was I going to give as an example for that? So rather cheeky, in a cheeky way, I hope it's taken this way. But yeah, um, I've actually, I'm actually assessing um, the example given in Australian Rainfall Runoff 2019. Um, in the same way, I would usually assess a normal stormwater management plan because in um, Book Nine, Chapter six, 6, they give an example of a Greenfields example. Um, they con it's not really fair, and this is our clause, they concentrate very much on the hydrological requirements of that um, development. I'm looking at it as if this came to me and I'm looking at my usual requirements for a small subdivision like this, am I giving it ticks or crosses? So um, I've given the, uh, the reference from Australian Rainfall Runoff 2019. The other reason, of course, I picked this is because I didn't have an example that I could without um, telling you who I'd worked for um, and who did the job, um, which I was not allowed to do for many jobs, um, I couldn't find an example to give you, so this was an easy out for me as well. Um, site context, it's a development in Ballarat. Uh, the requirements are retired flows uh, to pre-development conditions and the outfalls in the northeastern corner of the catchment. They haven't actually told me that. It's obviously there because that's where they put their, their retarding basin slash wetland. Um, design road and pipe network for major and minor flows and... Um, they didn't say in the example to meet um, water quality requirements, but I've assumed that you would, because you have to, under Clause 56 in Victoria. OK. So those uh, dot points were met, but um, wasn't quite clear on the third one. Catchment definition looked pretty good, but um, we feel a little bit that it needed more... Um, uh, what's the word, more uh, thought or talk about what's happening to the external catchment because it looks like there's a hill coming off here and it's hitting this road. Now, maybe, and it does look a bit like it, that the flow comes down the road and outfalls at this point here, but at the very least that means that road needs to be designed as an overland flow path. So we might give them the benefit of the doubt um, that, yes, that external catchment does miss. Does the entire 100-year flow miss? don't know, we need the capacity of that road. So these, you know, we need to start up. Again, a question is, doesn't mean they haven't met it. It means show us a bit more, please. And, ex and um, not including external catchments is one of the biggest error I see when I review stormwater management plans. OK. The catchment de de definition and the um, fraction of pervious look pretty good otherwise. Um, they used pre-development flow calculation using the regional flood frequency estimator, which is not a valid application of that model. Um, it, the regional flood frequency estimator uh, is um, uh, is basically a rule of thumb check on very large rural catchments. It's not applicable to a small kind of catchment like this in Ballarat, and. Um, it's, uh, it's very rough, even when you do use it. It's a black box type uh, calculation mission in 2019. It's just too rough. They should have done 
at least a rational pre-development check and maybe use the RFFE to check, to use that as a check on their pre-development flow. Um, a model, uh, they, that I'm, I'm assumed they've used something like drains to size their pit and pipes, so that's pretty good. Um, they did run with ARNR temporal patterns and IFDs, so that's good. Pit and pipe design to ARNR requirements, yes, anything like drains or civil CAD or 12D, uh, uh, those sort of models are fine um, for pit and pipe design as long as they use the right intensities. Um, road overland flow requirements to uh, ARNR, low risk definitions, I'm assumed they've, um, they're showing me that fine. So all these almost need a section in the stormwater management plan. Um, retarding basin storage volumes, outflow requirements, flood depth were specified. So on that RB in the um, northeastern corner, they did specify what the outflow was going to be, what the flood level was going to be, and so, so forth. And the flood depth. They gave me a flood depth. However, they didn't give me... Um, so that was their layout. It looks pretty, pretty good. The catchment boundaries look good. But there was no details in regard to that retarding basin at all. Um, and this is, this is the, again, that blob. This is just a blob. And some consultants will say, we've done it enough. We've shown you in the modelling that that can meet... Um, there's enough room there. But... Uh, the wetland area wasn't really specified. There's no, if you're going to have, there at least needs to be a gross pollutant trap before the wetland or a sediment pond before the wetland, um, and that hasn't been specified if you're going to have a, any sort of water body. Um, uh, access tracks, that sort of thing. So, yes, they've shown that a retarding basin can fit, and yes, they've shown batters and things like that, but they've shown no access requirements or anything else to make, to make you sign that very first thing off, is this maintainable? Can we actually maintain them? And, and the other thing is levels. They haven't t told me what the level is of the creek that they're aiming for at the upstream end, and they haven't told me the normal water level as well. Really, really important, because if we're aiming too high, they might need a bund to contain the flow, and if they need a bund, that's more space in your, in your reserve. Um, so, you know, all those sort of things are question marks in my head at this stage. It hasn't been shown. Doesn't mean it needs, you know, that it still can't fit in that site, but they haven't shown me. No detail, yep, yeah, I've sort of talked about that. No details of longitudinal sections up through the development, and there's a spell, I knew there was going to be spelling somewhere. Um, and if fill is required to provide cover over the pipe, so normally, again, because you're, and this is something we've found in the last couple of weeks as well, in a couple of jobs. Um, you're supposed to bring your pipes into that water body at or just below normal water level. That means your pipes are relatively high. To get cover over your pipes, you might actually need to fill your subdivision just to get cover over your pipes. So you need some longitudinal sections up your pipes. Now, maybe the drains does show that, um, but uh, we might give that... I w I, maybe I'm being tough. Maybe that should be a question mark. And no, main thing here is there's no details on the major water... There's a major waterway there. So if this was a proper stormwater management plan, they needed to do a, an analysis to show me the flood levels um, so that we knew that the development fill levels were fine. OK. Yeah, um, of course, this is just a pseudo stormwater management plan review, but it rang true to me. In looking at this, this isn't unusual to see this type of job come through as a review with gaps like this, not really being sure that what is required can fit into the site to achieve the water quality and the retardation requirements. OK, in conclusion, um, stormwater management plans can be complex. Modelling uh, is really important. Modelling is not design. Modelling is modelling. Modelling is a tool for design, OK? Design is designing to site. And that's what we need to go back to. And I think it, nowadays a lot of consultants are very good at modelling. There's some really good consultancies that do very good modelling, but maybe aren't the best designers, and we need to help them with that. We need to bring up the um, uh, knowledge and uh, skill set in our industry so that we're producing better designs, not just good models. Okay. The assessor must not be required to guess or assume drainage element configurations, outfall locations, fill requirements. Okay? That should be clearly shown in the stormwater management plan. And again, if you are guessing this, that means that just... It doesn't mean they haven't done it. It just means in your response to them, next time you send this into us, guys, show us this. Clearly show us this and how it fits into the site. Um, 
You require transparency and clarity. Models should be consistent with what is proposed and be usable and quizzable by council. And really, something like TwoFlow is not usable and quizzable by council. But especially for small jobs like that, um, things like drains, um, uh, really it's just the rational method. Um, we should be able to do a quick rational method check on the outlet of that whole pipe system and say, no, that seems like a reasonable flow. That sort of thing. That's a quiz. That's fine. Um, but, yeah, um, we need transparency and that things can be quizzed. The most important thing an assessor must guarantee is that there's enough space in the drainage reserves, that all the objectives are met, that no lots are flooded. Our first job as drainage engineers is not to, damage, is not to kill anybody, and our second job is not to flood lots and roads if we can, and as we want to in terms of overland flow paths. The assets can be easily maintained, and that's right up there. As council people, you need to make sure, because you're going to be looking after this, that you can maintain this. Access tracks, dewatering areas, uh, access to the um, gross pollutant trap, that sort of stuff. Uh, the council is happy with the type of retardation and water sensitive design elements proposed, and that's my little bias, I suppose, against uh, um, bioretention systems. And that comes from doing a lot of audits with councils where the miss rate on bioretention systems actually doing what they were supposed to do is pretty high. Um, wetlands, however, even if um, inlets and outlets are a little bit strange, they still act like wetlands. They'll still do their job. Um, council is happy for... Uh, the, sorry, the stormwater management is clear on what's actually being proposed, and it's, it's actually a design informed by modelling, not a modelling that is just the design. Um, if an assessor finds errors that cannot be easily explained, uncorporate consultants consider an independent review. Yeah, so um, there does seem to be some sort of um, mantra coming down from the consultants just saying, it, that's just it. You have done a good enough job, that's just it. Deal with it. No, you don't have to deal with it. If, 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 if any of these things aren't ringing true to you, just get an independent review. Um, uh, but hopefully you can get the skill set up in council. Uh, to do your reviews internally. The less you rely on people like myself, the better. And be careful of snowballs, as I said before. Now, we did a stormwater management plan for... Um, well, it was actually part of the PSP process for Pakenham, Cardinia Shire Council. I'm showing my age now. Um, and it was a five-year uh, job, essentially. But in the end, uh, it went to the PSP and the drainage strategy that was part of that PSP, much like uh, the Armstrong Creek one, uh, went to panel. And all the stormwater management plan documents and what ended up to be the functional design um, uh, documents and designs for, I think it was five, four wetland and retarding basins, um, uh, are available by that link. So if you want to see what that PSP had in regard to transparency and clarity and the type of drawings that were produced. Um, essentially, that, the drainage part of that PSP, yet I was on the stand for five hours, but um, it went through without pretty much any uh, problem after that. Um, so doing the job up front really saves a lot of problem at that sort of stage. Okay. I think we've got about ten minutes for questions, Ralph. So. So oh, um, we we'll often see um, a consultant put a put a plan like that, and then show some over, show some arrows for what the overland pipe flow path should look like. Yeah. Um, but I'm just wondering if you can give some ideas of what what's a um, a reasonable level of detail to, to prove that those that the overland flow path is, is appropriate, the streets are appropriate. Yeah, I think so. really um, they at the very least need to specify. Um, uh, a longitudinal section of the pipe up that section and probably a longitudinal section of the invert of the uh, um, curb and channel. And then um, from that, a typical section of the road. And if the longitudinal section is pretty much a uniform slope, all they need to do is show you the, where it's the least slope or may, and also maybe where it's the steepest slope because velocity and depth is the criteria. And, if you don't meet velocity, it's across, and if you don't meet depth, it's across. So the two worst scenarios are the, the shallow, um, the slope where it's not so steep and the slope where it's steep, and just typical cross-sections of the road reserve at that point um, to show that the velocity and depth can be met and that the flow is contained within the road. 
So they don't need to do a 2D model, but they need to um, highlight the fact in the stormwater management plan that the 2D model needs to formulate roads that look like this. With this cross-section and, um, and uh, to be shown, probably as a permit condition, uh, to be shown at the you know, functional layout plan stage that uh, all the velocity depth criteria can be met. But I, I think as long as it, you, you're relatively clear that going forward they can meet it, that the road, basically the road reserves are wide enough, um, then you, you know, that's enough at that stage, I think. And, and just in relation to that, um, you talked about the velocity depth um, ratio that mud and water um, have. In, um, from what I'm, I can see from ARNR 2019, they have um, quite restrictive um, overland flow path um, uh, depths and, and widths across the road, which is not consistent with Mel Water's criteria? Um, it's a bit out of my... We haven't really looked a lot at assessing to ARNR 19. It is relevant in rural areas especially, um, mm -hmm. but our take on it is the ARNR safety hazard criteria is more about assessment, like assessment of existing conditions, um, not so much about and so you, you get a lot of hazard maps showing, you know, this is really um, uh, high hazard, this is low hazard, this is fine, people can walk through there. Um, but uh, in applying it to design, um, essentially when you get to safe for people and cars, um, in other words, to tr transgress through it, it's a little bit different to the Melbourne Water criteria, but very similar. You know, basically the depths are less than um, 0.3 and the velocities are, well, in AR and R, less than 2. Melbourne Water, say, less than 1.5. And the VDs are less than 0.35, I think. So it, it's very similar. Yeah. Um, you can assess it against both and take the worst case. When you're doing um, your assessment of the flood modelling, and so you've got the different raw pegs and um, so many different software programs. I find it hard sometimes because I don't know them well enough because I've not done modelling myself to know what to look for. Um, the biggest thing I've found is, is the C value, the, the coefficient of runoff. I find that that's usually not up to scratch, it's usually lower values, which then gives you less volumes of water. Mm -hmm. What else should we be looking for when we look at those, considering that we're not professionals at that? Yeah, those? I think you need to separate it out into back to the requirements. Okay, so the first requirement is water quality. The model for water quality is music. Does that look reasonable? Yeah, so that's, that's sort of like yeah. a separate... Almost before that, you look at then the flood impact and uh, what is the flood model? What flood model are they using? And in small subdivisions, a pit and pipe type design type model is fine. Um, and for larger stuff, raw is a, is a good model. And if they're using something different in Victoria, um, you might need to quiz them. Why have you used that model? Um, and especially nowadays, I think the modelers are using... And then what we do is... Um, so Rob is getting the flows, and then the, the next model from that is um, getting the flood depths. And in the simpler sense, Man Manning's formula is a fine model. It's basically, you know, you can do Manning's formula on a, on a road, like in PC Convey or something like that. The next step up from that is HECRAS. So most of the stormwater management plans we produce are music, raw and HECRAS or music, rational method, and Manning's formula in very simple cases. Okay, so those three models are required. One for water quality, one for flow, one for flood levels. What is, what is making the, the problem a little bit now is that a lot of the modelers are lumping their flow model together with their flood level model because two flow can do that. And that's not very transparent because you often don't know what the flow is. They're just giving you a flood map, you know. So um, we find that awkward as reviewers. With music, I know you've got auditing tools for that, so, and, but I do know you've only got to tweak a few figures and it'll change your results quite dramatically. So, uh, with, but with raw and that, we haven't got the same assessment tool yeah. available for us. Um, you do, in that um, Australian Rainfall Run of 19 gives applicable um, uh, parameters to use for raw. And, and also um, in terms of their parameter set. Um, and if you need some help on that, we can help you as well because in Victoria, for most of southern Victoria, the Melbourne water parameter sets are valid. 
and that's applicable under AR and R19 as well. So there's, there's approved parameter sets that are fine, combined with um, fraction impervious values, which I think the IDM... Does, no, the IDM gives runoff coefficients for the rational method, not fraction impervious. Right. Um, but the best fraction impervious values to go back to are the ones out of the Melbourne Water Guidelines for the use of music. So the fraction impervious values you're using for raw would be the same as the fraction impervious values you're using for music. On that, um, good modelling is verifying or calibrating your models to something you know. So whatever model they're doing, whether it's a flow or a hydraulic model, they should be providing checks within their reporting at locations of a flow or a level that should be of a simple standard that anyone in this room who's done an engineering degree should be able to also produce. So you don't need to know if every little branch is working right, but at the outlet, you should be able to check using a rule of thumb rational method, does that flow look reasonable? At this location in the two flow model, does this flood level look reasonable? Based on previous floods, based on... And we often do it, we often use effect. rule of thumbs yeah. like the DSC curves, um, which I can email anyone in the, in the room, to, to hopefully they've given us a flow at that point in the model. Often with the two flow modelling, they don't give us a flow. But if they've given us a flow, we can just say, does that look right from a rule of thumb? Yeah, it looks reasonable. And the flood level, we might often just say, well, it's a really wide, flat floodplain. It's 100 metres wide. We'll just do it, model that as a pretty much a rectangular trapezoidal section and put it in our Mannings, you know, do a Mannings formula on it and say, OK, the Mannings are saying the depth is about a gum boot. That looks about right. You know, it's that sort of, you know, is that reasonable type, type look. Yeah. I think that's what you're talking about, Michael, yeah. Yeah, you just need to be transparent. <laughs> and if they're not providing those checks, you're, you, you can ask for them. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, having cracks in the pipes or pits definitely decrease the efficiency of the drainage. Sorry? Having the cracks in the pipes or pits will decrease the efficiency. During the final inspection of a subdivision or development, do we accept any cracks on the pipes or pit? And if yes, what is the tolerance? It's a very good question. What you're talking about is something that's um, a little bit of an issue in our... Um, you're, you're talking about uh, handover, essentially, of pit and pipe design, of pit and pipes in the ground. And if there's issues with the construction of the pits or the construction of the pipes, not up to standard, cracks in pipes, cracks in pits. We've seen formwork, formwork left in pits. Basically, um, no. You know, basically, if, it's, if, if, if it hasn't been constructed to an appropriate standard... Um, maybe some rectification works need to be done. Um, my issue with that is often they're not checked. The, the um, site inspection slash quality control process on a lot of things seems to be missing. Um, maybe self-regulation is happening now, so we need to be really make sure that that's, that's covered. Yeah. Um, just to answer that question, part of our council, we get CCTV footage of all our drains and it's assessed by uh, uh, accredited assessor to WSA standards, so it serves to 8.1, um, and if there are major cracks and things like that, they are rectified. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good enough to, to accept... Because um, you're, you're basically accepting something that's already got a problem on handover, and that's not good enough. All right, we're going to have to draw it close at that point. So I want you to uh, thank Val for a presentation.